Hey guys, I wasn't planning on making this video, but then I realized I had made a part one video on this ICO 369 sweep generator almost three years ago and never did a follow up part two, so I hope to rectify that right now. Now the reason I got this out on the workbench is I'm actually uh, planning on selling it to someone, but before I do, I want to give it a good going over and make sure it's working properly. Now when I left off at the end of part one, I was running it on all the original components and it was working pretty well. And uh, I was ordering up some new parts. Well since then I have installed those new parts, so we've got some nice new caps in here and replaced some of the resistors. And it's working better. And uh, I've got it calibrated and so on. Um, but there's one nagging problem and that is the sweep width is not what it should be. When you set the sweep width to maximum, it should be about 20 megahertz, and I've only got about 6. I'll show you what I mean in a moment. In order to test out and calibrate the sweep generator, I created this broadband detector as indicated in the manual. It's right here. I just used some old parts I had lying around. And here's how you hook it up to your sweep generator and its scope. So what this essentially does is it just rectifies and filters the RF energy coming out of the sweep generator and then feeds it right back in so you should get a perfectly flat response. And that's what I've got on the scope. So low frequency on the left, high on the right, nice and straight all the way across as we're sweeping from one end to the other. And then uh, it blanks and wraps around. Alright, so that's all well and good. But the problem I've got is with the sweep width. So I've got the sweep width cranked all the way up, which means it's sweeping the widest range of frequencies. I've got this set on uh, 22 megahertz right here. It's supposed to sym sweep symmetrically from one side to the other. So if I put my marker generator on and I put it on a range right here, 20 to 225, so it's going to cover the range I got on here of 22, and I rotate this you get that marker on there. So if I go as far left as I can and I'm a bit under 20. And if I keep rotating that and go higher and higher as it moves to the other side. Right there. I'm at 25. So it goes about 18 to 25 or 7 megahertz. It's supposed to go 20. You really want to have at least 10 when you're sweeping the IF on a set to really be able to see the entire um, bandwidth at once. So, something's not quite right. Alright, so, poured over the schematic, checked all the components around the soup generator. I'll try to quickly explain how this works. Earlier soup generators often used a mechanical means to sweep. For example, a tuning capacitor like this attached to a motor and it could rotate all the way around so imagine you're just like doing this going low to high, low to high, just back and forth doing this but with a motor so you don't have to do it. Well those have problems and then of course the motor will wear out over time and might not be so linear and so on so it's nice to have an all electronic solution but this is before the days of reactor diodes, so how are you going to do it? Well, they come up with a rather clever solution, which is this crazy looking coil in here. So on the left hand side, those windings are part of the oscillator. It goes up in here, this one half of the 6BQ7, which is like a traditional RF generator. And there's the variable capacitor to set the frequency, set the center frequency. So imagine that was a fixed coil, variable capacitor, just standard RF generator. The other side of this coil goes over through rectifier, some capacitors, uh, control for the sweep width, right to the AC line. So there's 120 volts AC come in, or 117 volts AC, 60 hertz, going through some stuff, and it actually goes right into that core. So what they came up with, let's see if I can show it. 
to you is this coil here. And the winding on the other side, that yellow, or sorry, that white lump there and one on the other side, that's where your 120 volts AC is going into. Those are the two, uh, yeah, two coils there. What that's doing is it's saturating the core or changing the permeability of that iron core, which affects the other side of it. So by pumping energy into this side, it actually affects the, the nature of this core material, which alters the inductance on the other side. So feed energy into here in a varying manner. It varies the inductance on the other side varies the output frequency of that oscillator. So that's how this works. Now, of course my first thought was not enough sleep with, gotta be something wrong with one of those components. So I checked them one by one, and double checked them, and swapped some out even though they tested good. Nothing was making much of a difference. I found, for example, this 15K resistor was measuring about 17K, and I thought, aha, I found the problem. I replaced it, made barely any difference. So then I actually cracked open the manual from the beginning and read through it until I got to the section on theory of operation. And I talked about this circuit in a bit more detail. Specifically, this capacitor, C25, 0.25 microfarad, they say is selected so that it resonates with this core to maximize your sweep width. So I think that 0.25 is sort of a suggested nominal value, but the actual value of that capacitor depends on your particular set. Now I replaced that with a point two two, thinking, oh that's plenty close enough and it'll work fine. I didn't realize it was supposed it was part of a tuned circuit. So what I'm gonna try doing now is take some alligator clips and try throwing in different capacitances in parallel to see if I can find that resonant frequency and increase the sweep width on this device. Well, in the end, I found that altering this capacitor value had little effect. But, altering these resistor values did. So I tweaked them a bit, and specifically I put a couple of these resistors in parallel to knock this value down. And now I've got the sweep width wide enough that I can use it to align a TV, so... I can bottom the mark around at about 19 megahertz, and I can crank this up and move that marker all the way over to the end, which is around 27. So I've got about 8 megahertz width. That's good enough to cover the IF band. So for a final check, I figure since I still have this Admiral chassis out and the sound is essentially non-existent. Might as well do a quick alignment on it. I followed the Admiral alignment instructions which include hooking up a 3 volt bias pack. This point down in here. You can conveniently inject your sweep generator on the little lug sticking out of the top of the tuner. And the scope pick off is down here, although in this case it actually goes back into the sweep generator because it uses a post marker generator and that's what I get which is just garbage it's supposed to look like that I've got the marker set for 24.3 so we should see sort of a double hump pattern centered on that <laughs> instead we've got a bit of a response over here and a bit over here can adjust the sweep generator back and forth so uh, we've got a peak at around just a little over 27 megahertz and the other one is it's a little under 21 so this could account for there being no sound and the picture not being quite as hot as it could be so the way the alignment instructions read is that you're supposed to use a fixed RF generator, so the 25.3 and 23.1, those correspond to the two humps there. But instead, 
I'm going to do it totally visually with the sleep generator because this doesn't do your fixed RF output. There's no mode for that really. You can set the sweep width to zero and try to use this, but this dial isn't calibrated. Only this one is. So, if you really want to follow those instructions, I would use a separate RF generator, something like this. But if you set your marker, for example, 25.3, 25, that's 25.5 right there, I think. Let's see, 25. Uh, yeah, so that's that's 26 is 25.5, 25.3 would be something like that. So there's my marker. So I want to twiddle some coils to get a peak response right there. To do that, they say to adjust A1 and A2, which are somewhere... A1, A2, those two guys, top of the chassis. So I will get an alignment tool, tweak those coils, and see if I can get this thing into shape. Well, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. So here's where one peak should be, and here's where the other one should be. So I've got my two peaks, are just not of equal height. I've gone back and forth a bunch of times and I'm starting to suspect there might be some other issues with this set because keep in mind I haven't uh, you know, recapped or checked the resistors or anything so I'm going to move on to the sound stage and then I want to power this set up with the speaker and see how things look and sound Before I fire this set back up there's something I really wanted to take a closer look at and that was this dubious capacitor repair I'm glad I did because, uh, as near as I can tell, there should be a two-section capacitor up here. A 30 and a 50 microfarad rated at 150 volts. It's these two guys here. This guy and this guy on the audio output tube. Well, what I found was a dual 20 and a 40. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to trace out how the wiring is going. I think two of them were put into parallel. But what I definitely noticed right away is that the ground lead common to both those caps was never soldered in place. It was just wrapped around that terminal and it's flopping loose. So, uh, you know, when I would power, power this up a few times previously there were times when the screen would go blank or there'd be some other weird anomalies and I'd turn it off and back on and things would be better. That might very well have been an intermittent connection there, so I'm going to get rid of that, going to get rid of these loose leads and get a proper replacement. I'll use a 33 and a 47 microfarad and temporarily I'll just tack them up under here. The original clamp was up under here like this. I'll wrap some electrical tape around them or something, just get it up and under there and tack them into place. And then I'll try firing this set up. All right, now instead of these two old caps flopping around, got two nice little new caps secured in that old mounting clamp. All right, got the chassis right side up, hooked up a speaker, hooked up a signal source. Let's give this a try. And I think I've got the box set for channel 3, so... Should be channel 3. Alright, got a picture. Pretty darn good picture, too. And sound, but it's faint. Uh, what I can try doing now is tweaking the channel oscillator slug. Well, that, that problem's still happening. Huh. <laughs> That's weird. Let's put it on channel 4 and the sound came in clear. These channel oscillator slugs must be way off. So there's still an intermittent connection somewhere in the set. I thought it might be that loose capacitor that I'd taken care of, but nope. So, threading my tuning stick down inside the tuner. Ah. Uh, no 
much better. Alright, so everything was off. IF slugs were off, channel tuning slugs were off. YouTube to bust me for playing the theme song. Uh, now there are modifications I've been reading about to get rid of these retrace lines and to add DC restoration uh, to this set, but save that for another day. In the meantime, though, I'll see if I can tweak some of these controls, get that picture center better. And, oops, it's horizontal hold. There we go. Turn the brightness down a little. It's a little tricky with these sets to kind of balance out the brightness and contrast. You don't see the retrace lines and you get the best picture. But... Yeah, well, that's more like it. So I've heard that these are the best performing of the seven inch electrostatic sets. And that's looking a lot more respectable now. All right, cool. Sorry. Alright, so now for real, I'm going to put this on the back burner and get back to my other outstanding projects. Hope you guys enjoyed. Get another video on this Admiral 17T1.